So is it, this is your first HLF because you were, you were a, 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 what used to be the Infosys Award yes. and now the ACM Award. Yes. Yeah. So what have you seen so far? What's uh, so far? No, it's been a really great event so far. I mean, we've only been here for a day, but I've had lots of good conversations with young researchers. I've met a bunch of the other laureates that I didn't know. I've renewed acquaintances with a few that I did. Uh, it's just generally a good forum to exchange ideas and talk about you know, research that excites you or uh, things like that. Um, so let's talk about mentorship. Who are your mentors? So my... Uh, Undergraduate mentor was a, a professor Vipin Kumar at University of Minnesota, who taught a great class that I took uh, the beginning of my senior year, and then I started to work with him on, um, you know, doing a senior thesis on parallel computation. Um, actually, uh, ironically, it was about uh, parallel training of neural networks, which I then filed away and then have now revisited 20 years later. I started to get back into using neural networks for practical sort of things. Uh, now that we have more computation. But he really kind of had a really good style of um, suggesting interesting ideas to explore. Uh, he's a fantastic teacher, and so I really enjoyed learning from him, although he was only at the university for a year when I was uh, an undergraduate. He would sort of transferred from another university. And are you, are you teaching now? No. I work at Google, so I lead our uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence research uh, group. Okay, but you, you since you're leading the group, I assume that you often will do mentorships or yes, some sort. yes. Uh, in fact, one of the things we've started in our group is a uh, uh, what we call a residency program for people who uh, want to learn how to do deep learning research. Um, and so that's a one-year program that uh, people come into our group. They spend a year, and we weren't actually quite sure what to expect when we started the program. We just kind of put out a, a, a website for applications, and we got lots of applications. And the people we accepted in the program, uh, we did it for the first time uh, in, for a year that ended last June. And we've just accepted our second class uh, starting in July, and they'll be the, in our group for a year. And it's been really interesting because we get a really wide variety of different kinds of backgrounds of people in the program. So about you know, a third are computer scientists, a third are sort of math or stats or applied math backgrounds, and a third are kind of a long tail of, of other science-related fields like physics and neuroscience and things like that. And just seeing everyone kind of come together and bring their own perspectives. Um, and some of them are sort of fresh out of an undergraduate program. Some are sort of people with PhDs or postdocs. And so that range of experience and sort of research uh, uh, depth and experience uh, varying uh, also is a really great thing to see. And lots of our research scientists are sort of spending time mentoring uh, these residents in our group. And uh, I'm just checking something. And around what age are, are these people usually? Uh, most of them are, about half are coming straight out of a uh, their last sort of academic environment, either undergraduate, master's, or PhD, or postdoc. And half might have a, a couple of years of, of experience working somewhere um, before they enter our program. So it sounds like it's similar ages to what you see at HLF. Yes, yes. So it actually kind of reminds me of like sort of young, enthusiastic uh, people interested in lots of different kinds of problems. Well, tell me what you were doing at around that age. So around that age, I actually took a gap year between undergraduate and graduate school because I felt like just uh, it was a good opportunity to take a year and do something kind of different. So I was working for the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, in the global program on AIDS where I was doing sort of uh, statistical modeling and forecasting of HIV and AIDS-related uh, sort of progression in lots of different countries around the world. And, and that was 91-ish or so? That was 1990 to 1981. Yeah, yeah. wow. So it was uh, interesting. Like, it was definitely an exciting time. The, the global program on AIDS was a really sort of vibrant kind of group um, and did lots of different kinds of work. Uh, our, our particular small group had uh, lots of interesting sort of statistical problems and forecasting problems, um, and I learned a lot uh, sort of developing software to do that. So that five-year period, let's say between the time you graduated as an undergrad, um, could you just sort of go over like how that five years? Went? Sure. So I was in Geneva working for the UN for uh, a year and a few months, and then I went to graduate school. Uh, I entered graduate school actually with the intention of studying uh, parallel computing uh, and trying to sort of improve the abstraction level for doing parallel uh, computation uh, because as my in my undergrad thesis it felt 
kind of difficult to get the, the parallel training of neural network stuff working, but I could see a lot of potential for being able to apply more computation to different kinds of problems. Um, and actually, I ended up uh, taking a compiler class as one of the required graduate classes, and I really liked compilers as well. So I ended up uh, switching directions a bit uh, in my first year of grad school. Um, and that was where I had met my advisor, who uh, was also a relatively new faculty member. So I was his first PhD student. Uh, this is Craig Chambers. Uh, and I learned a ton from, from Craig about you know, how to do research, how to sort of pick the right problems in uh, tackling things that are you know, achievable but are sort of really interesting and um, uh, are sort of important. And that, uh, you know, the process of doing a PhD, I think you learn a lot about how to do research. You also learn a lot about a particular area. And some people then continue in that particular area for the rest of their career or for a significant portion. Um, I'm a person that kind of, kind of likes to jump around between different areas um, somewhat regularly. So when I finished my PhD, I knew I wanted to go and find a place where I could uh, you know, have a wide variety of different kinds of things going on around me. And I could kind of uh, make connections and meet people. And that's how I ended up at Digital Equipment's uh, research lab in Palo Alto. And well, I'm sorry, where was, I'm just going to adjust here, where was your graduate work? At the University of Washington in oh, Seattle. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, just thinking back from your at your time then, uh, and you mentioned a few things that your your uh, advisor gave you. You're seeing those same age people here. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give them for like looking five years ahead from their their point now? Yeah, I mean, I think a really interesting thing to to do is to make sure that the problems you're working on, um, if you if they turn out as well as you hope will the world be a different place as a result of that? You know, I think if you're doing something and the best possible outcome is, eh, you know, that's not that exciting. So I think it's really important to try to be, you know, realistic, but also sort of uh, ambitious. Mm. One thing that, uh, this is just something off the cuff that a, the, a few of the most recent interview, uh, interviewees have said, is sort of combi uh, uh, comparing the, the idea of the solo researcher versus the team researcher. Do you have any you know, opinions about that? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the projects that I've worked on throughout my career that have been the most fun and the most impactful are the ones where um, you get together with someone else or a few other people and you all kind of have di slightly different kinds of expertise or maybe you know, wildly different. Uh, and collectively, you kind of get together and you try to tackle some problem and you make a lot of progress on it and you actually solve the problem, whereas none of you could individually do that. Because I think that's the way you keep learning from you know, doing research and, and tackling problems throughout your career is you put yourself in a position where you work with people who know things that you, that you do, do not. And so you know, that kind of rubs off on you, whatever their knowledge is, and then you go on to the next problem and you can may not have their complete level of expertise, but you at least have some understanding of, of those kinds of problems as well. That's kind of the, the, the theory of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, too, to bring together math and computer science people. Right. Um, and the Lindau, which, yes. is, which is even more broad than that. Well, what, actually, what, what are you working on now that's, that's really interesting? Yeah, so um, the last four or five, or actually five or six years, I've been working on sort of building scalable systems for training uh, artificial neural network uh, um, uh, machine learning systems. And this has been a really exciting area over the past five or six years, simply because we now, you know, that, that the abstraction of neural nets always appealed to me uh, from my time as an undergrad working on parallel training of neural nets. Um, and I was excited as an undergrad to get like, you know, 60x more computation using a 64 processor machine to, so we could tackle bigger problems. And it turned out that what we really needed was like a factor of a million more computation. So uh, by waiting, Moore's Law has helpfully provided a lot more computation. And now I think you can really see the benefits of these kinds of um, hierarchical abstractions that automatically learn from data. And you see 
powerful advances in lots of different fields. So in the fields of computer vision and speech recognition and translation, in sort of more applied areas like self-driving cars, because vision now works, that's sort of right on the cusp of, of be becoming a, real, a reality. Um, things like robotics, I think, are going to be heavily influenced by, by the fact that computers can now see if you're if you want to build a robot, it's helpful if the robot can see. <laughs> um, and we're starting to get hints of how to build systems that can understand language better. So we're now able to take a sentence and translate it with high quality using a system trained purely by uh, observing sentence pairs of English and French sentences that mean the same thing, and there are lots of examples of those. And the system has no knowledge of grammatical structure or anything. It just learns from, from examples. You mentioned, you mentioned self-driving cars and robotics. Um, anything else in, let's, I mean, five years now seems like an eternity, doesn't mm -hmm. it, for, for machine learning? Yeah, machine learning in particular as a field has been moving extremely quickly. And one of the really great things about the field now is that as soon as people do some piece of research, they put it up on Archive, uh, which is a preprint hosting service. And the number of papers that have been posted to archive has been increasing actually faster than Moore's Law over the past five years. So uh, we're now up to about, uh, I think it was 35 papers a week. Specifically about Specifically about machine learning. Wow. So you take just the few subcategories of like the subject descriptors for archive that apply to machine learning and there's phenomenal growth in, in the number of papers and more and more labs around the world are getting into this field. Um, there's tremendous demand for more compute because with more compute we can sort of try more ambitious ideas uh, that are sort of computationally intractable or were a few years ago. And that's, I think, going to drive lots of advances. And the speed with which ideas spread throughout the research community is really amazing because of this property that people put their research results up almost immediately. Um, you know, in a n more normal environment, that tends to be a m much slower paced thing. People will submit it to a conference, and then six months later, the conference will say, OK, we accept your paper. And then they might put it up on the web before the conference, and they might wait till after the conference. And that's like a nine month kind of cycle. We're now on like a one week cycle where a group will post some interesting new, new technique, and within a week, four or five other labs around the world have taken that technique added some wrinkles and enhancements and done some experiments in some other area and published their own sort of uh, derived work influenced by that work. And that's just tremendously exciting. Now, this is a great uh, advantage and opportunity, but it also sounds like it's creating a lot of stress for anybody, any young researcher in the field who wants to keep up. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I mean, it is almost impossible to keep up with the flow of, of research results in this field. And I think ultimately, it's almost impossible to do so. It's, um, you know, it used to be that, you know, a single person could know, you know, a large portion of the research going on in computer science. And that's been not true for a long time because the breadth of the areas and the number of people doing interesting research has broadened out, you know, over the past 20 or 30 years. And I think the same thing is going to be true in machine learning, where it's going to be almost impossible to keep up with the breadth of work in machine learning. And so people are going to have to find sort of areas that they can really specialize in and, and concentrate in, and also be informed about the other sort of related areas, but not sort of necessarily be as deeper expert in those. So specialization, you think? Could you give some examples of like specializations within machine learning that you think are, are promising? Sure. I mean, I think uh, you know, computer vision is one area uh, that a lot of people uh, put a lot of emphasis on in the research community these days. Um, I think things like unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning are examples where there's now even a lot of people in the field of reinforcement learning, uh, let alone the field of machine learning. And this is leading to you know, a lot of advances in there, but also means just keeping up with the reinforcement learning literature is, is challenging. Well, let me ask, ask you this for, again, thinking five year periods. I'd like you to compare what you were doing five years ago mm -hmm. and what you hope to be doing five years from now. OK. So five years ago was when I was just starting to work on uh, sort of large scalable systems for training neural nets. We had kind of in 2011, we started working on that. And in 2012, 
Um, we published kind of a first set of papers based on the scalable training system we'd built and some uses of it to do interesting work in unsupervised learning and in speech recognition. Um, and since then, there's been lots of advances in the work that our group is, has been doing and all around the world in the field of machine learning. I think in some of the fundamental problems we're facing now in machine learning are we're very good now at taking a supervised machine learning problem and training a model that is very good at one thing. And that one thing might be pretty complicated, it might be like translating from English to Japanese. But it's still one model that can do one thing and it can't do you know, thousands of other things. So I think there's gonna be a big push in the next five years to really build much more flexible machine learning systems that can do you know, thousands of different things. And that will help in many ways. So one is that um, if you can already do a thousand things and the thousand and first thing comes along, you can build on your knowledge of how you solve those first thousand to get in a better state for the thousand and first more quickly. And that can mean you know, computationally more quickly. It can also mean you need much less data or examples of what it is you're supposed to do for the thousand and first task because you can build on the, you know, six or seven related tasks that you already sort of know how to do and you've pieced together that this thing is kind of like these other ones but with these twists. Um, so I think building systems that are really flexible in that way, you know, multitask learning has been a, a, a sort of modest area of research in machine learning. Uh, but it's more like multitask learning of three or four things typically, not a thousand or a million. I think that's kind of the, the direction we need to head is really, really being able to, able to build flexible systems that can do lots of things. And uh, does that encompass unsu unsupervised learning? Yeah, and so unsupervised learning I think can also enter into this. Um, I think previous approaches to how we try to deal with unsupervised data are kind of not really the right ones. I think we, as a community, haven't really found the right approaches, but the things we've tried are you kind of use unsupervised data for a while, and then when you have a problem you care about, you start with that representation that's been learned in the unsupervised domain, and then you try to sort of refine it with the supervised data. But that's pretty un unlike how, say, humans learn from unsupervised data, right? You're, your entire childhood, you kind of wander around the world, you take in lots of unsupervised data, and then occasionally you get some supervised signal. Like you're riding around in the back of the car and you like point at this big thing and you say, truck. And then your mom or your dad says, no, no, that's not a truck, it's a bus because it's yellow and has kids in it, not, not stones. <laughs> <laughs> um, or something like that, right? So you get this interleaving of refining the, your understanding of the world in exactly the moments you want it. And I think that's really the way to leverage supervised, unsupervised data, is to use a lot of it, but to interleave it with these rich, sort of uh, high value supervised signals, rather than using it as a pre-step and then trying to do supervised learning on top of it. Interesting. Anything else you'd care to add? Because I think that's um, I think the the other area that's pretty exciting is much lower down in the sort of computer science stack, which is um, now that Moore's law, just from process improvements, has sort of dramatically slowed down over the past you know five years, ten years. Um, I think the really exciting thing is that because machine learning is such a, in, in particular, deep deep learning seems to be a really universal tool. You know, it can tackle things that we really care about in lots of different domains, speech and language and vision and you know, robotics. And so normally building specialized hardware often is kind of a losing proposition because you speed up some little bit of your computation and there's still a lot of the computation that can't be sped up by some specialized circuitry for encryption or compression or something. But if machine learning is really you know, at the core of what we want our computations to be in the future, that means that we can get a lot of mileage from specializing hardware to the kinds of computations that machine learning wants to do. Ooh. And so we're actually already seeing evidence of this through, uh, you know, Google has actually now built two generations of um, hardware chips and, and systems tailored to doing the kinds of computations that neural networks do. Uh, and that's essentially low precision linear algebra. 
And so if you can build a very specialized system that is really good at low precision linear algebra, that's going to get you tremendous speed ups and applicability for a broad set of machine learning problems. And it also means that level of specialization will allow us to sort of really target those kinds of applications and not worry about other kinds of, of computations as much. Okay. Anything you'd like to say about the, the uh, forum or about, the, about mentorship or about anything? Sure. I, I, I mean, I, I think the, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, is a, I, was, I was really thrilled to be invited this year and it was my first time uh, coming. And I think the idea of getting together people from several different uh, domains of expertise uh, who uh, you know, are well regarded in their field and then also bring together a lot of young researchers who have similar backgrounds and different breadths of expertise and just have lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations or one-on-five conversations and also a series of excellent talks uh, by the laureates uh, has been really, really great for me. I've really enjoyed the talks that I saw this morning. Uh, I'm looking forward to giving a talk tomorrow. Uh, it should be great fun. Thanks. Thanks.